So, around 10 years ago, and this continued for several years, but I used to go to Barnes & Noble every Friday with my mom because she was looking after younger kids and she would take them there for story time. And while there, I was, you know, older, so I would just wander around and look at books and stuff, and I would obviously read a bunch of them. And this was at the height of the Twilight craze, so there were knockoffs coming out left and right, all over the place. In fact, for a very long time, uh, the Barnes & Noble that we went to had an entire shelf in the teen section that was just labeled Paranormal Romance, and it was just full of nothing but Twilight knockoffs. And I read a bunch of them, okay? It was rare that I would read the entire thing, but I would pick it up, read like 40, 50 pages, and usually I'd get bored by that point and just put it back. So I read a lot of these things. And I gotta say that when I found out Hilary Duff wrote a series of books, I was kind of intrigued. When I found out that they were Twilight knockoffs, I thought, oh dear, here we go. But, having now read all three of these, look at this, woo, I can confidently say that Elixir is the worst Twilight knockoff in existence. This is the introduction song. It's not very good, but it's not too long. For those who don't know, Hilary Duff was a somewhat prolific child actor a long time ago. Like, uh, she, she had a show called The Lizzie McGuire Show, which some of you might have seen, uh, and then they made a movie off of that called The Lizzie McGuire Movie. She had a musical career for a while, and I thought that she had kind of just disappeared once she entered her 20s, which, honestly, by the standards of child stars, that's definitely a good thing, because a lot of them just wind up doing cocaine. But, uh, I found out that she is also still doing stuff, you know, she still does, like, charity work, she still has a TV show called Younger, which I've never seen, but it's several seasons in, so it must have some sort of audience. And anyways, the point is, at one point, she was an author. And I saw that, and I thought, you know, that's either going to be surprisingly good, it's not going to be great, but it'll be surprisingly good, or it's just going to be absolutely fucking awful. There will be no in-between. And, well, yeah, like I said, it, it's the second one. So, I don't know, enough rambling. Let's just talk about this specifically, and uh, this is going to be full of spoilers for the whole series, so if that bothers you, I, uh, if that bothers you, get over it. So the main character of the story is named Clee Raymond, or Clea Raymond, Clea Raymond. I honestly have no fucking clue how to pronounce her name. It, I've never seen it before. I don't know, whatever. She's a 17-year-old girl who is totally not a self-insert for Hilary Duff, and her father is a famous surgeon who, like, okay, here's the thing. Being a famous surgeon, to me, would basically mean that he'd be well-known within the medical community. Like, if he's a very good neurological surgeon, great. A lot of other doctors would know him, but your average person probably wouldn't know him. But in the book, it treats it like, yes, the average person does know who he is, and I'm just, okay, that's weird. Uh, and her mom is a senator in the United States Congress, which, again, in her own circle, she'd be somewhat famous, and the average American person would probably know more about a senator than some surgeon. But again, Clea is repeatedly recognized as being... Senator Weston's daughter in these books. In fact, out of all the uh, marks I made in here, I color-coded them. All of the purple ones are ones where she's recognized for being a senator's daughter for some reason, which is stupid, uh, and it happens quite a lot, actually. Did I mention that Hilary Duff was famous when she was a kid? So anyways, uh, this the story picks up around a year after Clee's father goes missing. Like, he went off somewhere and just went missing, no one knows what happened to him, and by this point she's accepted that he's most likely dead. And you hear that, you're probably going to be thinking, oh, okay, the story's going to be about her finding her dad. Well, just wait, we'll get to that. The story starts with Clee and her friend Reyna just hanging out in Paris on vacation before they enter their senior year of high school, which, uh, okay, fine, they're, they're from a wealthy family, that's 
that's fine, whatever. It's not a big deal. Uh, but then a picture gets taken of Klee, and in the background, you can see this uh, mysterious dark figure just standing there, and she's like, whoa, that's kind of creepy. And then she goes through some older photos that she has with her in them, and she notices that in the background, pretty much all of them have this guy there. And so at first she thinks that it's a stalker, which is a reasonable uh, conclusion to come to, uh, but she also notices that in some of them, this dude is just floating in the air, and he's also in pictures of her when she was like a baby and stuff, which is extremely odd. And so after talking to uh, one of her friends, a guy named Ben, who is uh, older than her, and even though he's only like 20 or 21, he already has a PhD in like mythology and stuff, which um, I'm not even going to go near that because if I talk about every stupid thing in these books, we're going to be here all day. But she talks to him about it, and eventually he admits that, okay, her dad also noticed that this guy was there, and he had no idea what he was. He was some sort of spirit or demon or whatever, uh, but eventually he figured that, okay, well, he's been there forever and he, he isn't doing anything, so I guess it's fine. Ben also admits that her dad was looking for the elixir of life, which, um, okay, kind of dumb, but you know what, this book's called Elixir, we had to have an actual reason for it being called Elixir. And around this same time, Klee starts having weird dreams, okay? Weird dreams where she is not herself, uh, and the mysterious dark man that is showing up in all of her photos is also there, and they're in some sort of relationship. Uh, but sh this happens in multiple different ways. Like, in one instance, she is a singer in a uh, speakeasy in the 1920s in Chicago. In another one, she's some noble woman that lives in England in, like, the 16th or 17th centuries. And there's, like, I think four or five different versions of that, but every time, even though she is different, uh, the mysterious dark man is the same, which is a little odd. And, again, this is the beginning of the story where things are actually somewhat intriguing, but don't worry, that won't go on for long. So Clea and her friend Ben eventually just go on vacation to Brazil because she's rich and she can do shit like that. Uh, and while they're there, she just happens to run across the mysterious dark man on a beach. Except he's real now. And so Klee, wanting answers, decides to run after him. But while she's running after him, she gets caught by these uh, people who she thinks are gangsters at first. And honestly, this is probably the stupidest part. One of them recognizes her as... A senator's daughter. They just say, hey, look, it's that senator's daughter. I'm like, you're in Brazil. Okay, you're... How, how many of you in my audience, how many of you recognize senator's kids? Okay, do you know what Ted Cruz's kids look like? No, you fucking don't. So, I don't know. Anyways, uh, her and Ben escape from the gangsters. They run off into the jungle uh, along with the mysterious dark man. His name is Sage, by the way. Uh, and they hide out in this place. And while they're hiding out there, uh, they talk to him, they demand some answers, and eventually he gives them some answers, which... Oh boy, let's, let's get into that. So apparently Sage is 500 years old, alright? He drank the elixir of life at one point, and now he's immortal. Seems straightforward, uh, except that also his soul is, like, bound to Clea's and she was his girlfriend 500 years ago in Italy, which she did have some uh, dreams about, and she's just been reincarnated every hundred years, uh, but every hundred years she also dies because she's mortal and Sage is immortal. And look, the, the point is, uh, Sage is immortal and she's getting reincarnated, their souls are tied together. Okay, sounds fine. And it turns out that Sage also met Clea's dad while he was looking for the Elixir of Life. And so, uh, after talking a little bit more, they decide, okay, let's go look for Clea's dad. And uh, he, the last place that they know he went to was in Japan. So they're like, okay, we're going to head to Japan. So they fly back to the U.S. and they book a flight to Japan, but it doesn't leave for another day. So the book spends a pretty substantial time, or amount of time, with just... Ben, Clea, 
Sage and Reyna hanging out in a hotel, and at one point, Sage and Clitoris go off to get some snacks for the rest of them, and then while they're in the car, she just pulls over and immediately jumps in Sage's lap, and then they start making out, and then they have sex, which, don't worry, by the way, uh, it's mentioned that Sage got a condom because he thought this might happen, which I want to make fun of that more, but honestly, like, it it seems reasonable. There was some tension there, and he wanted to be responsible, so, you know, whatever. Um, th I'm fine with that. But then, they both immediately profess their love for each other, and I just... Okay, so, the thing about all those Twilight knockoffs is that almost universally, the characters say I love you way too fast. Like, they've known each other for only a couple of day weeks, usually. Uh, but they usually, at the very least, meet in circumstances that are, you know, dangerous and hectic, and so their emotions are running high. So it's kind of understandable that they would feel that way. It probably wouldn't last that long, but it's understandable that they would feel, okay, yes, I do love this person, at that point in time. Sage has known Clea for two fucking days, okay? And Clea has known Sage for two fucking days. I don't care if you've been dreaming about him or if you feel some sort of weird connection. Having them say I love you that quick is just stupid. There's no way around it. Like, that. I really wish I could find other ways to describe it other than, no, it's just stupid, but I think it speaks for itself there. So they head to Japan, and they find the last place where Clay's dad was. And, uh, it's a hidden area in a mall in Shibuya. And, oh, by the way, Klee is recognized, uh, by passerby while she's walking around, because I guess young people in Japan are really big fans of the children of United States politicians. We're just... cool. Uh, but anyways, they go there, and they find this, uh, like mummified lady who's still alive hiding in the walls. And her name is Magda, and she was uh, Sage's old fiancé back in Italy 500 years ago. But, uh, she's still alive, but she didn't have the elixir of life. She, apparently her mother was a mystic and cast a spell on her so that she would live forever, but she would continue to age. And my first thought when I read that was, oh, okay, there's other types of magic beyond the elixir of life. Well, this this might be kind of interesting. Let's see where this goes. It never goes anywhere. Um, like, I, I really mean that. Like, throughout the second and third books, there's basically no other talk of mystics or magicians or magic of any sort outside of the elixir. And I'm honestly taken aback that this story could bring something like that up, and then just never mention it again. The characters never bring it up again. Like, I have no idea how it's supposed to work. Like, they didn't even do the absolute bare minimum on how to make this make sense. It's kind of beautiful in its own way. And I didn't mention this earlier because I kind of forgot, but... I mean, the book kind of forgot too. Uh, but there are actually two different groups that are after Sage. Uh, we're just gonna call them Cursed Vengeance and the Saviors. Now, basically, in Sage's backstory, which is revealed uh, completely with Magda, his backstory is that he was just some nobleman who lived in Italy about 500 years ago, and he was part of this secret society which had a couple vials of the Elixir of Life, and they kind of just hung around and didn't actually drink it or anything, and they didn't know where it came from, and a lot of them thought it wasn't even a real Elixir of Life, uh, but they just sort of had it and played around with it. Uh, which, okay, cool, whatever, I can buy that a bunch of rich assholes would do something like that. But, um, the thing is, uh, his girlfriend, who was the lady that Clea was and then she got reincarnated, uh, and his other friend also found out about it. And he told his other friend about it, his friend got a gang of people together, they stormed the place, they killed everybody, they stole the elixir, uh, and during the fighting, they actually stabbed Magda, uh, who she did live, uh, but 
Sage thought that she was dead, and so when they find her, he's very surprised. Woo. Uh, it's, it's not that important to the story at all, so I don't even know why I mentioned it. But the point is, uh, yeah, and uh, Sage gets stabbed as well, but they force him to drink the Elixir of Life, and then they tie him up and everything, and they notice, oh, hey, he's healed. So they flee the area and tie him up in a barn, and they basically spend many weeks torturing him to test how well the elixir works. It works very well. It's, a uh, you know, standard immortality. You get stabbed, it heals. You get set on fire, it heals. And so, you know, after a while, Sage manages to escape. He kills a couple of them, and then they run off. And those guys' descendants, the descendants of those guys who stole the elixir, become a group called Cursed Vengeance, and in the modern day, they're after Sage. And the, dis the family members of the other people who were... Uh, I, don't, I don't know, like the secret society that was looking after the elixir and playing around with it, uh, their family members became the saviors. And both of those groups are looking for Sage, but for different reasons. Cursed Vengeance, uh, they actually don't explain that in this book, I'll get into that in the second one, but uh, the saviors just kind of want him so that they can make more elixir and become immortal. So Magda shows them all that, and then she shows them the other lives that Clea and Sage have lived, but it turns out that every time it, it's happened, there's been another dude who's been involved with Clea, who she then leaves for Sage, and that dude gets angry, and his anger in some way leads to her death. So, like, for example, the first one was when he brought the gang in to steal the elixir, she got killed in the fighting. Uh, another one was where she, uh, he accused her of witchcraft, she got burned at the stake. And then, uh, another one was where uh, he was a gangster, and she left him for Sage, and so he just shot them both. But obviously Sage was immortal, so he lived. And it turns out that Ben was actually being reincarnated over and over again. And his soul is also tied to Clea's. So, in other words, his destiny is to be reborn every hundred years, and then get cuckolded by the same guy over and over again. Somebody actually wrote this. And then finally, Magda shows them a little vision of Clea's dad coming to meet her and talk to her about the elixir of life a little bit, and then she apparently also told him about the soul connection and how Clea's is destined to die, and her dad like freaks out a little bit. He's like, okay, I need to break the connection and then he leaves. So I just want you to remember that they have confirmation that he's still alive. Uh, and anyways, Magda then tells them that, okay, the only way to break the connection is for Sage to die, so she gives them this special dagger, which apparently can kill him, uh, but he has to wait until midnight on a full moon and then plunge it into his heart. Um... Here's the thing, again, this ties back into the magic never really being explored or explained in any way, but how did they make this dagger? Like, how, how, how do they know that it'll kill immortal people? Like, so far, at this point, the only immortal we know of is Sage. The only person we know who drank the elixir of life is Sage. So how do they know that this will kill him? Have they experimented, done it before? I... okay. So they drive off to a secluded area of Japan, and Sage is preparing to kill himself, and little does he know that Klaus has called Cursed Vengeance, and so they come in, they shoot at them a bunch, they kidnap Sage. End of book one. There's basically nothing in here that is redeemable for this first book. Like, at all. And... I mean, I know I spent a while describing the plot here, but a pretty substantial portion of it is taken up by characters just kind of hanging around and talking and Klee pining after Sage, and also apparently Ben is in love with her. In fact, one of the worst lines ever is uh, in this book describing Klee and Ben's relationship. Now. There was a picture of them taken where she wasn't looking, but Ben was looking at her, and she's talking to Reyna about it, and then 
apparently Reyna can tell just from looking at him that he's in love with her, and okay. But then this happens. It could just be the picture, I said. They caught him at a weird moment. Yeah, a weird moment when he thought no one was looking, so he showed how he really felt. I gave Raina the phone back and shook my head. Ben and I are like brother and sister. That's gross. Hey, I read Flowers in the Attic. It was kind of hot. Seriously, who the fuck would write that? Like, that, that line alone kind of cements this as one of the worst books I've ever read, but honestly, for the most part, it's just boring. There's, like, almost nothing happening in here. Because even, like, like all that stuff with Sage and finding out about the backstory and everything, that's, like, the last 50 pages of the book. You know, and this is, it's not a particularly long one. It's only a little over 300 pages. But still, the majority of it is just people kind of hanging around and not doing much. Even in the worst Twilight knockoffs that I read before, there was some sort of actual plot there. You know, even in Twilight itself, like, there were evil vampires that they were fighting, okay? There was an actual conflict in which people could die and they could lose things that they loved, so there were stakes involved. Now, that's not to say I think Twilight is particularly good, it's not, but, like, at least there was an attempt there. This one has nothing. So now we move on to Devoted, book two, and this one is the longest, um... It's only 350 pages, though, and, I, well, it's kind of in the same category as the first one, where a pretty substantial portion of it is just people hanging around doing stuff, but, you know, let's get into it. So, by this point, it's been a couple of months since Sage was kidnapped, and Klaz has been angsting about it a little bit. And so she gets visited by this psychic family, who just project themselves in front of her, and talk to her a little bit, and she's like, whoa, what the hell was that? And then they leave. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, oh, I thought James said they don't really do anything else with magic in this series. They don't. Believe me, I'll get to that soon enough. But, so that happens, and while all this is going on, uh, Reyna has a new boyfriend named Nico. We'll get to him later. And her mother has an assistant named Suzanne. And Suzanne appears to be into Ben, and Klaus feels that Suzanne is more attractive than her. And she's, so she sees her as a romantic rival and as a sexual rival. And so immediately when I read that, I thought, okay, so Suzanne is going to be a bad guy. Like, they, they weren't even being subtle about it. I was thinking, okay, Suzanne is going to be the bad guy. If she's... A female character who poses any sort of threat to the main female character, then yeah, she's she, she's gonna be a bad guy at some point. Turns out I was wrong, she isn't, but they also just kind of drop her after a certain point in the story, so... And this book, unlike the last one, which was just told from Clala's point of view, this one is actually split between her and another person named Amelia. Now, Amelia is one of the psychic family, that uh, appeared to Klee at the beginning. And it turns out, uh, through her backstory, which takes up around, I don't know, a quarter of the book? Like, it's not that much. Uh, it turns out that she was, is actually 2,500 years old. Her and her family also drank from the Elixir of Life. And while I will say that these segments aren't good, they are better than the rest of the book by a fair margin. Uh, because it, it mentions that she was from ancient Greece, but, like, they actually call it ancient Greece. You know, like, if you're gonna do that, just say, in the land, we were born in the land that is now called Greece, or something like that, or we were born in Achaia, or something. Come on, guys. Uh, but, anyways, her grandfather, um, went on an expedition way out into the wilderness, into, like, Ethiopia area, and he got separated from his group, but he found this little pool of what he found out later was the elixir of life. And so he took a sample of it, and he was able to find his way back home, and he used it to, like, bring animals back from the dead and all that sort of stuff, but nobody believed him. And then one day, Amelia, when she's only seven years old, just drinks the whole thing, and then her family's like, well, she's gonna live forever, we don't want to leave her alone. So they go out, they find 
the pool of the elixir of life and they all drink from it so that they all become immortal. And, uh, but they drink the whole thing, like it disappears and it's not like a spring that bubbles up. They dig and dig and they can't find any more. And the thing about that is that that's not a terrible way of introducing the elixir. Like, it can be this mysterious thing that we don't know where it is or where it came from or even really how it works. And I would actually kind of like that, you know, leaving that element of mystery there would be cool, but that raises the question of where did those other guys, where did that secret society that Sage was a member of in Italy, where did they get the elixir of life? Like, if this was the only place to get it, and that's gone now, where did they get it? And for that matter, how do they know how it works if this one family of four people is the only pe people that have ever drank from it. I don't know. So, you know, they live as immortals for a very long time and things are great, but then, uh, more recently, just a couple of years before this all starts, um, it turns out that basically the elixir is kind of wearing off, so their bodies are no longer working properly, but their minds are still, uh, fine. So, Basically, what it'll eventually come down to is that they won't be able to see or move or anything, but their minds will still be active, so they'll just be sitting there in the dark for all eternity. And they're like, well, that sucks, so let's try and get some more elixir ourselves. And, uh, so, there's really no good way to put this. They develop psychic powers by just thinking really hard. Like, that that's the thing about it, is... Okay, this, this series has magic already. If they just had been practicing magic so that they were able to, like, project their minds out places and move stuff around and show other people dreams and stuff, that would be fine. Okay, but instead, they have it so that their, uh, her, Amelia's grandfather... In fact, I don't think any of these people get any names other than Amelia. I think it's just Amelia and then grandfather, mother, and father. But anyways... Uh, her grandfather just one day says, you know, if we practice really, really hard, we'll be able to have psychic powers so we can still go around places while our bodies are not moving. And for starters, that's just... It, it doesn't quite fit with this setting. You know, like, the idea of psychic powers in this manner is a little bit different from magic. At least it feels different from magic. And so, it just doesn't quite mesh with this setting. It feels very anime. And on its own, it might have been okay, but it just clashes with the tone that this is setting. Not to mention that they just straight up admit that they don't know how the powers work at all. Like, listen to this. Unlikely, but not certain. That was the thing with our psychic powers. It was hard to say what we could and couldn't do. It changed. Something we could easily do one day might be impossible the next. Or something one of us had never been able to do could suddenly be simple. That is just Hilary Duff coming straight on, looking at the camera and saying, these powers are just a plot device. And granted, I've read stuff where the powers are just a plot device before, like they can just do whatever they need to at that point in time, but I've never seen somebody just admit it. So anyways, Amelia and her family need to get more elixir of life, and it turns out that the best way to do that is by allowing the saviors to kill Sage in that uh, ritual I described before, which will then turn his blood into elixir, and then they can all drink from it, and sweet, they're immortal again. Seems pretty straightforward, except Amelia doesn't think that it's right that they should do that, and so she's secretly trying to help Klaus's throughout the, the book. Okay, that's fine. Like I said, Amelia's parts in this book are the best, but that's not saying much. So, while they're searching for Sage, Ben and Klaus, uh eventually go looking for Cursed Vengeance, the people who are trying to kill him for some reason. And through a long, not particularly interesting investigative process, they find their hideout, and they get captured, but Cursed Vengeance doesn't immediately kill them. They just sort of show them around and show them all their training and everything, and they explain that uh, 
yes, they are all descendants of those guys who stole the elixir and forced states to drink it before. And it turns out that them and all their descendants have been cursed for hundreds of years. Like, none of them ever live past the age of 30, and the years before that are really nasty. Like, they get horrifying diseases, they have awful luck, they get in car crashes, all sorts of just bad stuff. And they want to kill Sage because killing him and restoring the elixir to the earth is apparently the only way to lift the curse. Again, how they know this, I don't know, but... Cool. Like, Cursed Vengeance are the good guys now. Like, I know that they were probably trying to do something where the bad guys are just sympathetic, but in this case, no, they just made the bad guys the good guys. Because Sage already kind of wants to die. Like, that's why he was trying to kill himself before. And him being alive causes nothing but misery for not only Cursed Vengeance, but for Clea and Ben and anyone else that might be affected by their soul bond. So, yeah, Cursed Vengeance are the, ba are the good guys now. Hey, remember how at the end of the last book, the last they knew of Clea's dad was that he was still alive, and... Yeah, they, they never look for him in this one or in the next one. Like, there, there's really no good place to put that in, because... Partway through the second book, in fact, just a little ways into the second book, she's looking at her dad's grave and just thinking, Man, I miss my dad, he's dead. I'm like, the last time you saw him, he was alive. He, he's still out there somewhere, that, that's what the witch lady told you, aren't you gonna look? No? Okay. It's almost like the author just decided that that was a dumb plot point and didn't want to expand on it. So Amelia shows Clea some more visions of what Sage is up to in captivity, and apparently his captors are trying to make him fall in love with another girl in order to, like, break his bond between him and Clala, which... Okay, fine. No, none of the magic is ever explained in this in any way, shape, or form. And, like, look, I know I'm a type of guy that likes to have things explained to me a lot because I find that interesting, and not everybody is like that. But I would appreciate at least the bare-bones, bare-minimum explanation for what's going on and how this works and how people know that it works. Like, just a little bit, a little something I would appreciate. So seeing this, Clea gets jealous, so she takes Ben out somewhere, makes out with him a little bit because she knows the psychic family is going to show that vision to Sage and it'll make him jealous or something because... Clea has basically no personality in this other than just being kind of a petulant child at times. So do you remember how I mentioned that Reyna has a boyfriend named Nico? Well, it turns out he's a member of Cursed Vengeance. Oh. Yeah, he's cursed, and several of his siblings have already died because of the curse, and so he wants to fix it and just, you know. they He talks with Clea a little bit, and they agree that, like, okay, we don't need to fight right now, but I don't want you to kill Sage because I love him. I knew him for two days, and I love him so much. So seeing all that, Sage decides, you know what, she'll be better off, so he decides to break the bond and allow the saviors to kill him. Which, okay, fine, whatever. And then Amelia manages to give the location to Ben, who then tells Klee, and then they tell Cursed Vengeance, and they all swarm, attack the compound. And while they're there, there's a gunfight that ensues, and it's a race against time, you know, Sage is tied to the altar, they're about to kill him at the stroke of midnight, all that nonsense. And the psychic family is also, like, throwing around trees and stuff, using their powers, and... At this point, I feel like the imagery should be at least kind of cool, but it's just not quite clicking yet. And I think part of the problem might be that this entire climax takes place over the course of like six pages. So during the fighting, Nico has this super special magic dagger and he's about to kill Sage with it, but he just can't bring himself to do it. And then Ben tackles him and Nico gets stabbed with it and dies. And then while this is going on, Somebody else grabs the dagger and stabs Sage with it, and his blood spills out as the elixir of life into a bowl, and they're like, yes, we won, but then the bowl spills, and it all goes to the, into the earth, and it stops being good. So, no more elixir, no more immortals, yay. 
Also, Amelia uh, is fighting her parents and her family using her psychic powers, and I think that she kills all of them and herself. It's never made clear what happens, and again, their powers can kind of just do whatever the plot demands, so I don't give a shit. But, here's the thing. When Sage's soul was torn out of his body, because he was immortal or something, it's, it was seeking out a new vessel, and so it went into Nico's body. Ta-da! That's the end of book two. Devoted. So now we move on to book three, which is True. And this one is the shortest of all of them. It's only 287 pages long. And I know that the first two books didn't have much plots, but this one has just none. Okay, there, there's a climax, which lasts about 12 pages at the end, but everything other than that is just... no. So at the beginning, uh, they find out that Sage, now in Nico's body, is no longer immortal. Like, uh, the, the stab that killed him originally has healed up, but other than that, he's just a normal person now. Uh, but it's a good thing that he happens to be in a similarly aged body, of a man who is also very attractive by Clea's standards. So, you know, that that's nice. They can still have a happily ever after or something. I don't know. Anyways, and it starts off with them uh, trying to tell Reyna that Nico is dead. And, oh, by the way, this one also has several chapters from Reyna's point of view, but those are even more pointless than the Amelia ones. Actually, no, I will say that whatever else about the Amelia chapters, they, they did serve a point to the plot, to the story, but th this one, the Reina chapters, are mostly just, I am sad. Here's me remembering stuff that the audience already saw, but from a different angle, but I am sad. Anyways, they, they tell her that Nico's dead, but she doesn't see Sage in Nico's body, so she freaks out and runs off. And I just want to put this in now that much later in the book, like almost halfway through, I think, they actually, she actually sees Nico walking around with Klee, and she freaks out, thinking that they lied to her that he was dead because he was cheating on her with Clea. That's the dumbest fucking thing in a book full of dumb fucking things. Throughout this entire series so far, these books have been horrifyingly boring and extremely annoying at a lot of points, but nothing in them has really made me angry up until now. Because at this point, they start realizing that something is wrong with Sage, that his soul isn't quite taken to his body right. And what's going on is that he's having memory lapses. Like at one point, him and Klee go up to her room and eat some dinner, and uh, then they leave and come back and the plates are there. And he's like, hey, we should eat. And she's like, we just already, we already just ate. And Sage just completely loses his shit, starts yelling at her, and then like breaks the plates. And okay, like at this point, it just becomes an abusive relationship. Because it continues on for a while where Sage uh, will forget something, she'll remind him of it, he'll get very angry, start breaking shit and yelling at her, and at a couple of points, he actually does physically hit her. And so, she has this I mindset where she's thinking, okay, it's something wrong with his soul, it's not his fault, I'm gonna try and fix it. And at this point, this actually did get really under my skin. This actually did anger me a lot, because the thing is that this is abusive, okay? Like, it's straight-up abusive. I mentioned that already. And a lot of these Twilight knockoffs, like I said, I read a lot of them, a lot of them do portray an abusive relationship. Like, Twilight itself has Edward uh, trying to cut Bella off from her friends and family, trying to isolate her, and trying to control her. Uh, which is obviously not okay, but at a glance you could maybe say, like, okay, that's not straight up abusive because it's not physical. This is very blatantly physically abusive. And the fact that Klee has this mindset of, well, that's okay, it's not his fault, I can fix him, it's okay, I love him. No! No, get the fuck out. 
right now. Like, the instant that he started breaking those plates, the first time that he lost his shit, that's when you should have gone, because that's indicative of something much, much worse. And this is aimed at younger people, okay? This is aimed at teenage girls. So the fact that that is being portrayed as romantic, just no, okay? That actually pisses me off a lot. So while they're trying to fix him, uh, Klee hears about this place which is basically just a cult where you can get a different soul put in your body. And so she goes there for a while and she finds out that they don't have much to say. Uh, but then she finds this one person whose soul actually did get taken out of her body and it was replaced with the soul of Magda, the old witch lady from before. And oh yeah, Magda killed herself. It, I didn't mention it because it doesn't actually affect anything whatsoever. Magda only exists in this story to give exposition. Uh, so anyways, Klee's talking to Magda in her new body, and Magda says, like, Oh yeah, go talk to the Greeks. Ooh, and that, like, that's all she gets. And then Klee tries to leave the cult, but they won't let her. And then her friends come back, and they're like, Hey, let our friend out. And they're like, Whoa, whoa, she's here willingly. And then they're like, She's a senator's daughter. And they're like, Oh, okay, well, let, yeah, let's let her... We have to let her go now. And... Under normal circumstances, that would make sense. Like, it does make sense. Like, okay, this isn't just some random person. This is someone who's connected to a powerful politician. Let's not fuck with that. We'll let her go. That does make sense. But the thing is, if Klee was constantly getting recognized all over the place, not just in the U.S., but in foreign countries as well, why don't these people know who she is? Shouldn't they have immediately recognized her as well? I mean, she was there under a fake name, but... Yeah, okay. So they go back home, and throughout all of that, they discover that apparently there's still an echo of Nico's soul inside of his body, which is why Sage's soul can't properly bond with it, and why all this other stuff is going on. Again, giving him an excuse for his abusive behavior, but... Just, fuck it, man, we're going past that, because I'm just gonna lose my mind at Hillary Duff if that keeps going. Hillary, what the shit? But, anyways, so they find that out, and through some more research, Ben discovers a way to get the remnants of Nico's soul out of his body. And so he tells them, and apparently when Magda was saying, help the Greeks, get the Greeks, what, get him to the Greek, whatever, what she meant was that they have to go to the Boston Commons, where there used to be a hanging tree, where they used to hang pagans. I have not been able to find anything to corroborate that. Like, they did hang people from that tree, yes, which, it's been cut down now, but they did used to hang people from that tree, and they did hang people for heresy, but it was mostly like, Hey, you're Catholic. You're not supposed to be Catholic. Like, fr from everything I found, there was no pagans that got hanged there. Okay, whatever. So, they start the ceremony, and as it's going on, it switches to Reina's POV. And apparently, apparently... Ben wrote down his evil plan. Like, I actually posted this on Discord because it was so fucking stupid. I'm just gonna read this. But everything Ben wrote was about finding ways to get rid of Sage's soul out of Nico's body. Not to help Nico, but to get rid of Sage forever. The worst part was the words scrawled in huge dark pen strokes and underlined three times. Convince Reina Nico's soul is in danger to get personal item. I was livid. So, I, I dropped it, but I don't give a shit. So, in other words, Ben literally just wrote his evil plan down in a notebook. Like, yes, haha, I will kill Sage, and then Clea will be mine. Haha, -ha, like, that, that's literally just what he wrote. And then her friend found it. And then so during the ceremony, she just tackles Ben, and it's over. Like, like in less than a page, it's over. And... Like, they send Nico's soul out of his body at that point. Um, so everything's great now. And then the epilogue picks up, like, six months later. Clea la 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 and Sage are just living together, and she's about to start college. And her and Reyna are still friends, but Ben is out of their lives, and they apparently still talk to him now and again. And they ask Sage, like, hey, would it be alright if we were friends with him again? And Sage is like, eh, I'll just go with what Clay is, wants to do, because 
It's not like this guy tried to murder you or anything. As dumb as this whole book is, as dumb as this whole series is, the last line is probably the most insulting. The last line is Klee saying, because the most important things in life, dot dot dot, they're eternal. And I'm like, really? That is the dumbest, like, pseudo-intellectual, pseudo-philosophical shit I have read in a long time. Nothing in life is eternal. Okay, this is a story about immortality. At least, it's supposed to be a story about immortality. And the thing that just about every story about immortality gets right is that immortality would kind of suck. Okay, because you're still living, but your loved ones will die and fade away. All the things you love will die and fade away. It doesn't matter what we're talking about that you love. It could be things, it could be places, it could be institutions, it could be people, it could be the relationships you have. They're not eternal. Okay? And that's another thing about this that I wouldn't say it quite angers me, but it does annoy me to the point where it's almost anger, and that's the way that it portrays romantic relationships. And I don't mean, like, the abusive stuff. I already talked enough about that. I mean... It starts with Sage and Klaalavidvailala having a literal soul connection. Like, they're destined for each other. They're meant for each other. They can never have anybody else, and or they won't be happy. And then, that that's not how real relationships work, okay? It's two people, or three or four, or ten people, I'm not going to judge you, but it's usually two people, and it's that... They meet each other, they have stuff in common, they like each other, they complement each other's flaws, and they make up for each other's weaknesses, and they just enjoy being around each other. That's the gist of how it, romance works. That's the gist of how all relationships work, really. And sometimes that doesn't work out, okay? Sometimes you'll only be together for a short time, other times you'll be together for a long time, but then you'll realize that one or both of you change, and so you split. Like, that's why divorces happen, because people once loved each other, and now they don't. And sometimes it goes until one of you dies, and if that's the case, great. But, again, this idea that there's a soul connection, that you are only meant for one person, that you'll never be happy if you don't meet the love of your life when you're 16, I mean, uh, again, this is aimed at kids, this is aimed at teenage girls, so I don't like that they did that. And then that very last line where it says, the best things in life are eternal, well, obviously they're not. Okay, nothing is eternal, like I was already saying. And just... It, it's, it's just dumb, and it makes no sense, and I hate it. So, for several years now, I've said that Blood Rose Rebellion is the worst series I've ever read. And... That's no longer the case. Now it is Elixir by Hilary Duff. That is the worst series I've ever read. Blood Rose Rebellion at least had some stuff in there that I could point to and say, yeah, that was okay. Like, the climax of the final book, I pointed to in my review and I said, yeah, that was alright. That was, that was okay. That was a decent, uh, th that was decent. You know, it wasn't great, but it did something right. And there were a couple of ideas that threw out to the books that Though they were usually executed pretty poorly, I could at least see what they were trying to do, and I could say, yeah, that's, that's neat, you could maybe do something with that, you would need to get a better writer for it, but you could do something there. But this just has nothing, okay? And even, like I was saying before, Twilight and the other clones, they at least had an actual plot, okay? Like, most of those I didn't find very good, but occasionally I would find one that was good, because and it was usually because there was a supernatural element. It's like, okay, there's demons coming out, and I'm in, and the teenage girl is in love with a demon, and he, she needs to help him out with fighting the demons. Cool, that's, that's fine. Like, that's basically the plot for all of them. This one just has nothing. Okay, it might have seemed like there was an actual plot the way I was describing it, but that's because I was just describing the events that had actual meaning. Like, if I described everything that happened in these books, I'd be here, like, three times as long, and I'd be describing a lot of Klee and Ben eating at diners. And when I'm talking about how Twilight has a better plot with higher stakes and than this, you have failed completely, okay? Stephanie Meyer at least had 
a basic idea on how to construct a story. This has none of that. And here's the thing. Hilary Duff does definitely deserve the blame for why this is bad, or at least the lion's share of the blame, but she doesn't deserve all of it. Because celebrities write books sometimes, and they're almost universally bad. Like Steven Seagal wrote one a while ago, Sean Penn wrote one a while ago, and they're both awful. And the reason for that is because they don't need to be good in order to sell. Like, like I said, they're celebrities. They have, they have name recognition. They have brand recognition. Which means that if they just have an idea for a book and they're like, oh, okay, this is... It could be a vanity project. It could be something that they have actual passion for and they want to do it. So I don't, I don't blame them for wanting to publish something. They will just go to a publisher and the publisher will say, like, okay, since we have the name recognition of this person, we won't really need to spend money on advertising or anything. So, yeah, let's just, let's just get it out there. Let's not put any effort into it. So they don't need to do things like editing. They don't need to do things like multiple drafts. And the authors themselves don't need to spend years honing their craft and practicing to get better at it. Because regular people who become authors, that's what they have to do. So, yeah, I can't really blame Hilary Duff because she was kind of screwed from the beginning. Like, there's no way that publishers were going to invest more money to make this better when, one, she has the name recognition, and two, it was a Twilight clone that came out during the height of the Twilight craze. Like, it was guaranteed some sales. And granted, this one was a New York Times bestseller, but, like, also a lot of times when celebrities write books at all, they usually will buy a bunch of their own copies in order to bump that up, and then they'll, like, give away copies at fundraisers and stuff. Like, Political pundits do it all the time. Like, whenever you see Ann Coulter or Bill O'Reilly at the on the New York Times bestseller list, that's usually what they're doing. But, anyways, the point is that Hillary Duff was still the one that came up with a lot of this dumb shit in here. And she was still the one that was writing a self-insert story. Because, remember, I never really described Klee in here because, one, she has no personality whatsoever. I believe I mentioned that a little bit. Like, she just kind of exists. Like, she, she likes photography. Great. Oh, and also just a little dumb bit that I didn't have a chance to mention is that uh, she publishes her photographs under a fake name, and that fake name is Alyssa Grande. Okay, first, sue somebody. Secondly, they spell it two different ways in the book, which, again, just kind of reaffirms my position that these were not edited. And the only description we get of Klee physically is that she has blonde hair, blue eyes, and fair skin. And that's... that's it. And also, on the front cover for this copy, the model is literally just Hilary Duff. So, it's very much just a self-insert type of fanfic thing. The difference being that usually those are just published online by some nobody teenager. Hilary Duff was 23 when this first book came out. You have no excuse, girl. And that's really all I have to say. This is... This is just the worst series ever. I mean... Everything about it... Just everything about it was either boring, annoying, or rage-inducing. So, it's only a little bit worse than Blood Rose Rebellion, but it's still the worst series I've ever read. Like, the worst book I've ever read is still The Lovely Bones, don't worry, I don't think anything will ever knock that off its perch, but, uh, I don't know, I guess let this be a lesson to you about, I don't know what lesson there is to be gleaned from this, but, uh, thanks for watching, uh, please like and comment and subscribe and all that other stuff I'm supposed to say here, um, sorry, my memory's going away, I gotta go hit my girlfriend later, uh, Thanks to Christopher Hawkins and Joseph Pendergraft and all my other patrons that you see on here. Please share this video. Bye.